thank you, Rory. Uh, on behalf of my co-authors, I'd like to thank the program committee for the privilege of the podium to talk about, as Rory said, a very important initiative that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Our group has uh, accumulated an impressive list of disclosures. Uh, luckily, none of these are uh, relevant to what I'll talk about. So measurement and surgery, we, we just heard some about it. It's been a hot topic uh, for at least the last decade. How do we quantify and, and manage and improve what we do? We've done a good job over that time of, of measuring outcomes. We have uh, a lot of different databases that we contribute patient volume to, uh, and, and that's really changed the culture. We've done a good job of identifying preoperative things and being able to modify those factors to produce better outcomes. But largely over this time frame, what we all do every day in the operating room has remained a bit of a black box. How do we accurately measure the impact of how we perform as surgeons on these outcomes uh, for patients? Over the last uh, few years, people have started to try to take a peek inside that box. Some of these papers uh, people will recognize uh, correlating performance in the operating room with outcomes in bariatric surgery uh, from the group out of Michigan. And then uh, from the UK, the development of a robust tool in lap colon surgery to try to start assessing people at the attending surgeon, performing surgeon level. Um, you know, these are all great uh, first steps uh, in this direction and, and we sought to kind of build upon this work with what we're doing. Um, so our goal was to really develop a robust tool for starting with fund application to be able to actually take the brave step forward and make a competency decision based on, uh, on assessment of uh, video performance. So we, we start talking about validity of an assessment, right? Uh, a modern discussion around this, and modern being since 1985, though we don't always hear ourselves talk in this way, we, we have a unitary validity theory that has five different types of recognized validity evidence, and you see that there. You take pieces of evidence in these categories and you make an argument for using the results of that assessment to support some kind of a decision, right? So the results of an assessment have validity evidence. The assessment tool in and of itself is never actually validated. Only the results for a specific purpose. So if you leave here with nothing else today, leave here with that. Um, the importance of the, the varied importance of these different types of validity evidence is based on what you intend to do with that information. So for credentialing or uh, for a credentialing type exam or a certification exam, like a board exam, Content validity evidence, how you establish what's being measured is really the most critical type of validity evidence. The internal structure, which is essentially reliability, is important. The consequences, which is generally where you set the pass-fail score, also important, but really content is key. So what are we talking about when we talk about content validity evidence? Basically, you want the content of the assessment to match the construct you're trying to measure. So for this project, the construct is this circle is uh, uh, represented by is laparoscopic fundoplication. So through a process of task analysis uh, and review, what you're trying to do, break this procedure down into steps, and then populate those steps with the skills, the sub-steps that are critical, the errors that can be committed that really represent that performance. So this process um, will, uh, will highlight what that looks like. So you start out trying to do a task analysis, so to fully define the construct that you're trying to measure. And for us, we ended up interviewing a total of 42 subject matter experts across North America, South America, Europe, and you can see uh, the intended variability. This wasn't a convenient sample. This was very uh, intentionally picked to, to represent the entire spectrum of folks per, uh, performing this procedure. To give you some uh, uh, relation to the other papers that I uh, quoted, this step was done in the tool that was used in the Berkmeyer paper by two people. Uh, and in the CAT tool by seven people. So this represents a multiple fold increase in the diversity and sampling used to develop this tool. And that diversity contributes to this content validity evidence. So from that, those semi-structured interviews of this level of expertise, we generate what's called a task inventory. And this is an example of that. There were identified six steps, a total of 21 important sub-steps. 
There was a total of uh, 47 uh, identified errors. This is kind of errors in the first three areas, errors in the second three areas, and 11 identified skills uh, that were uh, thought to be important in performing in this domain. So once you have this list, it's important to provide weighting to these areas to, to decide which things need to be included in the assessment and which things are maybe less important. So we looked at measuring current importance of these areas and future importance, particularly of the skills, to make sure we weren't gonna measure something that was going to essentially go away in the short term. Uh, this scale is rated, uh, you know, towards the top, absolutely essential steps. These are things that we, when we wrote the descriptors, are steps and skills that would have direct and significant impact on the patient outcome. That's, things were all anchored in patient outcome uh, across this spectrum. We also looked at difficulty, and difficulty was centered around how many alternative strategies do you need to have in your tool bag to be able to consistently achieve a good outcome on this step. And then frequency is, is uh, relatively uh, self-explanatory. So uh, this was uh, generated into a questionnaire which was distributed last year at Sages. We were making pitch to many of you to complete this. You can see the demographics of folks who did. So 188 folks uh, completed it uh, who have a very active uh, experience, ongoing experience in fund application. If we compare this to the other studies I quoted earlier, uh, for the Berkmeyer tool uh, used in that paper, there's about 35 people that did a review, and for the CAT tool, there was uh, 17, I believe. So again, a multi-fold increase in establishing this content validity evidence. So with that weighting, you gotta decide what makes the cut. So we made some decisions as our focus group. So for steps, things that were 4.5 or above on this scale, so things that had a high degree of likelihood of impacting the outcome, and things that required at least some uh, tools in the toolbox to consistently achieve those steps. Um, these are the means of the, the items that made the final cut. For errors, we wanted to be relatively inclusive, so you know, anything, but a, anything above a, a minimal or, or slightly above error was included, and you can see the mean uh, importance of the errors that made the final cut. Similarly, on uh, the different skills, we wanted to use highly important or essential skills that are used at least half the time. So this all speaks to uh, a concept called construct irrelevant variance. We wanted everything on the, that, that is a threat to the validity of an assessment. So we wanted everything that was on the tool to have a high level of, uh, of relevance to a performing fund application. So those are the that, those actually did come from different data sets. Uh, interestingly, I ended up with the same mean and standard deviation. Um, we did not use future importance as a criteria to make the final rubric. However, everything from a skill standpoint that made the final rubric was thought to be at least going to maintain its importance as a skill or slightly increase over time. So uh, at least based on the, the large sample we had, we don't anticipate a dramatic change in what this will measure in the near future. So we had very uh, high level of agreement uh, of the 188 SMEs that filled out this questionnaire. Uh, the overall agreement up in the .95 range and none of the sub steps falling below the uh, typical uh, target for a high reliability assessment like this of .8. So what this looks like, if you parse it out, is basically the, the entire visualization step, visualization step falls out. A few of the other sub-steps uh, fall out. Most of the errors were preserved, except for the loss of the visualization step. So the errors remained intact. And then we ended up dropping off the endoscopy skill and the managing assistant skill. But the other uh, nine skills uh, remain represented on the rubric. So if you conceptualize what this looks like is it allows you to still sample this construct, this, the content uh, for a lap fund application, but now each different section has a, a weighting and an importance based on the experience and, and opinion of a broad range of experts across uh, multiple uh, countries um, who do this procedure and monitor their outcomes. So in conclusion, uh, content validity evidence is the most important uh, type of validity evidence, particularly for high stakes credentialing exams like this. Uh, the 
work we've done to date represents the strongest content validity evidence for any tool relating to surgical performance that currently exists. And we're uh, ongoing work to establish some of those additional uh, pieces of validity evidence that hopefully we can bring back to this forum in the future. I'd like to briefly acknowledge some others who are not authors on this paper, but per, uh, participated in several of the retreats we had during the development. I thank you for your attention and happy to answer questions.